Well, good morning. Uh, any children that are left here who haven't been dismissed for Sunday school, you're, you're free to go at this time. Just wanted to see if you're paying attention this morning. And you were. You, you stayed seated, so. It's good to be here with you all. My name is Eric Bobbitt, and I serve as one of the pastors for our church family. It's great to be together in this way. Let's pray. Lord God, we say thank you, and uh, in so many ways that seems inadequate to try to put words to all that we've already experienced and heard uh, and learned this morning. We ask, uh, Holy Spirit, uh, that you would be active now uh, as we read uh, your word, as we hear from you the truth uh, that you have laid before us. We ask, uh, Spirit, that you would give uh, an openness uh, to your truth, that we'd be receptive, Lord Jesus, to your service and care and love for us, that we'd respond in the ways uh, that you want us to. And Lord, we also pray that uh, what, we, what we receive from you this morning will spill over uh, into our time together and into our homes and into this community and into our schools and workplace and that you would be alive and vibrant and vital uh, in all of our conversations and all of our responsibilities and relationships. In Christ's name, amen. Well, as we have been experiencing this morning, Palm Sunday begins the observance of the Passion Week of Jesus. And this term, passion, comes from the Greek word pasco, which means to suffer. So this is the suffering week, or the week of suffering. Matthew 16, 21 points uh, to the origins of the term Passion Week. Matthew 16, 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So multiple themes like sacrifice, betrayal, redemption, and hope emerge out of these last tumultuous days. And honestly, there's probably no more profound week in the history of mankind than the one that we are studying for this week. And this morning we're going to look at a text in John that reveals a central motive and compelling illustration of why Jesus was relentless in his determination to be in Jerusalem that week. So you can turn to John 13. We're going to read the first 17 verses of John 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father... Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, 
he said to him to them do you understand what i have done to you you call me teacher and lord and you are right for so, for so i am if i then your lord and teacher have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet for i have given you an example that you also should do just as i have done to you truly truly i say to you a servant is not greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So chapter 13, we just read the beginning of, is a hinge moment because Jesus has concluded his public ministry at this point and he gathers his disciples privately to reveal to them more about himself and what it is that he still must do. He also defines their identity and what they are assigned to do. Chapters 13 through 17 are known as the farewell discourse. These five chapters in which Jesus speaks to his disciples. This is really a a final course in discipleship that he's giving to them. It's provided for us a robust introduction in chapter 13, not by words, but by actions because Jesus presents a startling enactment of his role as the servant. You probably noticed the movement of this text. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He has a dialogue between himself and Peter, and is followed by a monologue as Jesus explains the meaning and the significance to these astonished recipients of a foot washing. Jesus' stunning act is simultaneously a symbol a display of love, a symbol of saving cleansing, and a model of Christian conduct. This account was recorded for us to relish and to emulate the deep descent of God to serve and to rescue humanity. His descent was literally to the soiled feet of his followers. So we will work through this text this morning in three movements that Jesus Uh, recognizes his impending departure in the first three verses, then he illustrates radical serving love, and then he commands that same kind of love uh, in the last section. So here at the beginning, the first three verses, Jesus' impending departure, we see that this small dialogue transitions the reader from Jesus' public ministry to his private discussions with his disciples. He looks backward and he looks forward. And we learn of his affections and his intentions as he approaches his last hour. In verse 1, we read, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. As his divine mission came to a close, Jesus has fulfilled one of his purposes to love his own who were in the world. There's a distinction among people. Some people belong to God in a particular way. They are his own. Jesus' connection with them is highlighted with these poetic words. He loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. Being more than a mere chronological statement, meaning that he loved them to the end of his earthly life, the Greek term that's used here, telos, means literally that he loved them to perfection, to the uttermost, absolutely, totally, completely, without reservation. This foreshadows Jesus' unique demonstration of his love on the cross, which is immediately ahead, and the foot washing, which anticipates Calvary. And later, as Jesus continues his course in discipleship in John 15, He he confides to those who are closest to him, greater love has no one than this, that somebody lay down his life for his friends. He loved them to the end. Verse 2 is a reminder that an invisible battle rages against the goodness of the Creator God. It reads, During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. The mention of Judas connects for the reader the foot washing to the death of Jesus. The devil and Judas are now accomplices in a conspiracy of evil 
to bring Christ to his gruesome death. It also reveals to the attentive reader that along with the faithful, the rest of his faithful disciples, Jesus knelt in lowly service to Judas, to his betrayer, knowing that this traitor would bring about his execution. What a moment that had to be. Verse 3 supplies us with how Jesus maintained a calm boldness and a resolve while being assaulted with threats, betrayal, and an impending unjust death. It reads, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, possessing unparalleled status and power, nothing the devil could throw at him was a realistic threat. He was in lockstep with the plan of the Father, and nothing could be taken from him. Verse 4 begins the next section in which Jesus initiates one of the most dramatic scenes in the Bible. So here we have verses 4 to 11. Jesus now illustrates a radical serving love. Jesus rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that he'd wrapped around him. Now, at the entrance of first century Hebrew homes was a large basin of water to wash a guest's feet. This was necessary due to the dust and the mud and the animal waste that was left on country roads and on town streets. This unenviable task was an act of hospitality to honor guests. In the context of this culture, foot washing was the most demeaning household task. Considered lowly even for a servant, it was meant truly to be an act of a slave. There is no parallel in extant ancient literature for a person of superior status voluntarily washing the feet of someone of an inferior status. There's no example in ancient literature of this being done by any person. Jesus was inverting, flipping on its head, the cultural norms of honor and shame. Jesus was boldly bringing to life what he had previously taught. If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last and be servant of all. The one who is least among you, this is the one who is great. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. One writer from antiquity illuminated this glorious paradox that we, found, we find in the foot washing. He wrote, He who wraps the heavens in clouds wrapped round himself a towel. He who pours water into the rivers and pools tipped water into a basin. And he before whom every knee bends in heaven and on earth and under the earth knelt to wash the feet of the disciples. Can the chasm between a transcendent creator dwelling in mystery and majesty and glory, can the chasm between that being and the mundane, banal, earthly aspects of human existence be spanned? Not everyone sees this as possible or even desirous. Richard Dawkins, the outspoken atheist, wrote this, I don't see Jesus coming down and dying on the cross as worthy of that grandeur of the supernatural. It strikes me as parochial. If there is a God, it's going to be a whole lot bigger and a whole lot more incomprehensible than anything that any theologian of any religion has ever proposed. The notion of the infinite God himself entering his world at the level of a man who participates in objectionable acts of menial service is incredulous to some people and compelling to others. Yet this is the heart of the Christian faith. That the grandest, most wonderfully incomprehensible thing the Lord did 
was to become a human person who found joy in taking on the role of a lowly servant. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming a servant, obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Distinct, holy, transcendent, yet choosing to be intimately involved with us as the servant of all. That loving condescension is the glory of our God. And Richard Dawkins is not the only person who found fault with this plan. Peter reacted to the outrageous prospect of Jesus touching and cleaning his dirty feet. Verse 6, He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what, am I do- what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Peter made his refusal most emphatic by using the strongest negation in the Greek language. Jesus recognizes the scandalous nature of his actions and that it's beyond Peter to understand what Jesus was doing. But Jesus reassures him that later they will come to understand. Eventually for them, Jesus' horrific execution, his unforeseen resurrection, and subsequent life in the Spirit completed the picture pulling back the veil to reveal the symbol-laden meaning of their foot washing. But Peter's refusal is not accepted by by our Lord. On the surface, we can understand Peter rejecting Jesus' attempt to overturn social convention and kneeling before him with a basin. Frankly, it would be embarrassing and it would feel unfitting for your superior to take the form of a slave at your feet. But spiritually, what is at the heart of Peter's denial? The answer to that critical is absolutely critical in order for us to understand this entire provocative scene, and most importantly, in realizing how Jesus wants to encounter each one of us. Peter, who's representative of all of us, had things upside down. He intuitively knew that his place was in subjection to his master. But Jesus places a destabilizing demand on his followers. We need the Son of God, our King, to wash our feet, to serve us. Naturally, we come at it from the reverse, that we must serve Christ. The radical orientation is that it's not Christ but us who first need to be served. I let that soak in for a minute. The radical orientation that it's not Christ but us who first need to be served. In the language of this account, you need Jesus to wash your feet. In a seemingly illogical arrangement, Jesus is placed below us to serve us. This cuts against our religious sensibilities, which tell us that as the inferior... As the creature before one's creator, my first role is to give, to be the servant. But what can easily feel like humility and deference is really self-righteousness and the pride of rejecting the grace of God. Yes, I owe him my allegiance, my absolute obedience and total service, but first I must allow him to serve me. Why? Why is that so? It's because I realize my condition before God, that I am spiritually broken, I'm corrupted, and I am needy. And unless the Lord, who is holy and uncorrupted, comes to me and serves me in my need, rescues me from my spiritual blindness and my sin and my rebellion, I am forever lost. My reclamation begins with Jesus' initiative, not with mine. The demand of the gospel is that we need Jesus Christ to wash our feet to serve us. This is humbling, but it is oh so freeing. Now, personally, I find it challenging to receive 
from God and from others. Because I think somewhere deep inside of myself, I think or I feel that I'm unworthy. Maybe some of you uh, experience this in your life as well. To defer and to deflect feels like humility. That I shouldn't want or need or that I don't deserve the service of others or their attention. But I've come to realize that this is a false humility, and it's actually a kind of pride. It's a refusal to admit that I'm needy, just like everyone else. And spiritually, this is a refusal to lay myself open before the Lord and need His service, and ultimately the salvation that only He can provide. God, in His loving, generous care, has placed Jesus below me to serve me. Because otherwise, I could never reach him to be reconciled, to serve him, which is what I long to do. Another way to say this is to let yourself be loved by the Lord. You cannot pave for yourself the road to relationship with God and the gifts of joy and hope and transformed character. If I believe myself too humble, or unworthy to receive God's free grace, his service to me, then I'll miss out on it entirely. Well, how did Jesus respond to Peter's outright rejection of his offer? We read this exchange between them. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you will have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean. The Lord gave Peter and all of us an an ominous warning. If I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. This is a bold and defining requirement. Jesus says, If I can't wash you, you can't have me. To which Peter extends another exuberant modification that what Jesus offers uh, isn't enough. The Lord shouldn't wash only his feet, but also his hands and his head. Jesus clarifies this for Peter by giving the illustration of bathing and washing to explain the fullness of cleansing Christ provides. The bath, the results of them being completely clean, is not the foot washing that they're receiving. The work of Jesus' sacrificial and Then atoning death has not yet been accomplished on the cross, but it's being applied to Peter and his disciples. The cleansing, salvation has been received by faith in their association with Jesus. Peter already belongs to God. The initial and fundamental cleansing from Christ is a one-time act. Those cleansed by Jesus' atoning death will need subsequent sins washed away, but the fundamental cleansing can never be repeated. Jesus uses a common experience from natural life. One who's taken a bath and who's essentially clean will still need their feet washed after a walk on a dusty road. A full bath would be unnecessary at that point. John expresses this thought in a similar manner in his first letter where he's addressing those who who believe and who have received eternal life. He says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Continued confession of sin is necessary for those who've been cleansed by grace through faith in Christ's atoning sacrifice. Jesus confirms that Peter is clean, but not so everyone in the room. Jesus and the reader know the identity of the betrayer, the one who is not cleansed. Well, the action and the dialogue come to a close as Jesus puts on his outer garments and returns to his place. And this is the third movement in the text in which the Lord now gives a fuller explanation. Verses 12 to 17, he commands a radical, loving service. So settling into his place, back with the disciples, after the stunning display of self-effacing service, he starts with a simple question. Do you understand what I have done? So this is a dad or a coach asking you that, and you realize, well, if I don't know now, I guess I'm going to here in just a minute. (laughs) So before illuminating his actions, Jesus reminds them of his identity, of who he is to them, for doing comes from being. 
He says they rightly call him teacher and Lord. Teacher is equivalent to rabbi, respectful way of addressing a religious leader or a teacher. Lord is the title of someone who deserves anything from respect to great reverence. This title can also be in reference to Jesus' divinity. So his status of teacher and Lord establishes the foundation of now how he turns the attention to the disciples. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash the feet of others. The greatest prophet of God, the revered Messiah, who raised people from the dead, healed diseases, made demons scatter, ruled the powers of nature, knelt on his knees in subservient posture before them. Their master became their servant. And now he's commissioning them to do the same. He reiterates, For I have given you an example that you should do just as how I have done to you. The Greek word for example here is understood to mean a pattern or a model. Washing their feet was more than a private dramatic object lesson. More than a one-time act, it was meant to establish a a pattern, and not for Jesus only, but also for them. The recipients of radical service were now to become sources of it for others. Such a challenging responsibility could be met with resistance, so Jesus supplies an irresistible logic. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. He identifies himself as a teacher. Now he extends to two other kinds of relationships, master-servant and the superior and the messenger. This pattern is not something that has escaped the disciples' attention. It has characterized the character and the life of Jesus during the three years that they have walked with him and ate with him and slept with him and endured so much with him. As it defined his life, It now redefines theirs. They are to be servants themselves, motivated on mission. In John 20, after his resurrection, Jesus commissions these men, As the Father sent me, so now I send you. As they launch with the radical message of Jesus' resurrection, they also take with them his example of radical service to shape their disposition and character. Jesus then links knowledge and action reminding us of the beautiful marriage of the mind and the will. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. To understand and to do the service modeled by the Lord is to be blessed, to come under the favor and the goodness of God. So foot washing is such a telling image of the kind of service Jesus We do not reach down from a superior position to assist, to assist someone in need. We kneel down and we reach up to them to serve them. If God treated people like that that were around him, then bowing in humble, often thankless service is not a demotion. It is a promotion to the kind of life that the Lord enjoys and values for himself and for us. So in considering this passage and all that the Passion Week means for us, here's four implications. First of all, receive Jesus' love. This is the call for us, is to receive Jesus' love. Resistance is futile. Yet we persist in shielding ourselves from the very things we need. The truth is we need Jesus to serve us. He can be rejected outright in our pride that refuses rescue or in a religious zeal that wants to serve him first. So I invite us to assess our true condition and identify what we need to come from outside of ourselves and recognize that Jesus stands gentle and kind and strong and willing to serve, and to give us what only He can. Now, perhaps some of the language and the concepts this morning are unfamiliar to you and need more explanation. You might be intrigued by this Jesus and how He treated His friends. Well, I'd love to talk more with you about this, if this is intriguing but hard to understand, 
or maybe someone who's brought you to church today or someone uh, that you know here would love to talk to you as well as you explore this, this notion of receiving the love that Jesus has for you. To know that God wants to kneel down and serve you is astounding. The foot washing that Jesus performed was shocking to his friends. And even more scandalous was his shameful execution by crucifixion, the death of the damned. These two are linked. The foot washing points to the cross. The exalted one, truly God and truly man, assumes the role of a servant for the good of others. First to clean their feet and then to cleanse them of their sins. If you've never trusted in Christ's death and his resurrection to forgive you of your sins and to open up this relationship with the Lord, then I invite you to do that thing. And this week, as we gather for Good Friday service on on Sunday for Resurrection Sunday, join us at these services. Be prayerful. Consider what it means that Jesus loves you in these ways. Because we really don't want to be with Peter and proclaim You shall never wash my feet, Jesus. Second, speak of Jesus serving character. Speak of Jesus serving character. Jesus said to his followers, As the Father sent me, so I send you. So we're to be ambassadors of his humble service and also to speak of him. Not just actions, but by our words as well. So this week, Easter is going to be full of lots of cultural attention um, and traction right? It's, it's the week of Easter. There's, there's uh, Easter egg hunts, and there's Easter dresses, and uh, where are you going to be with family, possibly, on Easter weekend? It's springtime, talking about new life. It's just in the air, and all kinds of relationships and conversations. How about you consider trying to just naturally insert into one of these interactions how you've been thinking about a surprising element of Easter, and ask the person if they, if they know that Jesus washed the feet of his disciples before uh, Easter weekend. That on that night that he was going to be betrayed, he knelt down and washed their dirty feet as an act of service to them. But Peter, one of his disciples, refused for that to happen. And just let that be in the conversation. See if it piques any interest. And then talk about that we need to receive what Jesus has to give to us. And if the conversation goes much further than that, it gets into his death on the cross and his resurrection and that we need to receive and trust in that. So this kind of story really could be an interesting addition to the things that you're normally talking about. uh, And it adds an interesting element uh, to, to people's thoughts about Easter. Third, love well to the end. Love well to the end. Jesus loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. For the good of others, he gave of himself fully and utterly and absolutely and completely without reservation. Now, what does that bring to your mind for your life? For you to love to the end. Well, you don't live on an island. People are constantly moving in and out of your life, some intimately, some casually. And what would it mean for you to love them to the end? Well, chronologically, that means all the way faithfully to the end, till life leaves your body. But more broadly, it means that you possess eyes that see and a heart that feels and hands that serve because others matter and you want to care for them. Thirteen days ago, uh, my 92-year-old mom passed away. She was hospitalized in Greenwood for four days, but until her body gave way to disease and to weakness. My brother Brian and I were privileged to be able to officiate uh, her funeral. And as I've thought about it since, an an appropriate way to describe my mom is that she loved well to the end. Not only consistently over the course of her 92 years that were granted to her, but really in a full way with people. This is... uh, Some of what I expressed about my mom at the funeral, this is something that I spoke at the funeral. Her name is Enid. Enid valued people. She was observant, discerning, and assertively engaged with those in her sphere of influence to do them good. In her tireless interest and care for others, Enid reflected a biblical value that is described in C.S. Lewis' sermon, The Weight of Glory. Lewis writes, There are no 
ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Every person created in the image of God, gifted with divine purpose and immortality, holds a unique and valued place that Enid sought to understand and remember. Now, would you like that to be on your epitaph of your tombstone? That Kathy loved them to the end. Or Brad loved them to the end. That Steve loved them to the end. Fourth, and lastly, serve radically. Since Jesus was superior in every way to those who washed his feet, none of us can claim to be so superior that we are above the washing of another's feet. Ephesians 5.1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Like Christ, we're called to have a pattern of heart and mind bent on helping others in a posture of humble service. This is beyond politeness and social kindness. Jesus forged a path of initiating service on behalf of another that is costly to yourself. Putting another first in a way that threatens reputation and comfort and social standing and protecting your time and your treasures for your own personal pleasure. Now, I cannot prescribe all the ways that we can do that in coming days, but I invite you to pray and to ask for opportunities. Ask for the awareness to discern needs around you and the courage to get outside of yourself in substantial and sacrificial ways. For when our Lord did this, he carried his cross to Calvary and perished so we can live. In Hebrews, for the joy set before him, he carried the cross. This is the path to joy. Lord Jesus, we receive from you so many good things. We receive from you this example, the pattern, the model that you lived, that you've shown to us, not only in your words, but in your actions with your disciples. We receive that from you. Lord, thank you for all the ways that you care for us. We thank you, thank you especially this week for what Passion Week means to us and looking toward Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. Lord Jesus, we love you. We receive from you. We want to be your people. In your name we pray, amen.